Hi everyone, Timothy Ferris here with a few words about quantum computing. A hot subject, a lot of excitement about it, some would say hype. In this talk I'd like to make three points. First, what all the excitement is about. Second, how quantum computers work. And third, why I think that um, their potential is even greater than the hype might suggest. And why I've described quantum computers as the most fascinating machines in the world. So let's start with all the publicity about quantum computing. Quantum computers are still in a crude experimental state. There are hundreds of them in university and private laboratories, and they, they work, but they're noisy and very limited at this early stage. But even at this point, it's clear that they are capable of working much faster than conventional computers and much more efficiently. Now, the speed is important because classical computers, which use millions of tiny switches or transistors on a chip, although they're beautifully designed and cleverly managed to keep doubling their capacity famously every about every two and a half years, are limited in the um, extent to which they can go much further. Ultimately, you run up against, ironically enough, quantum noise. Quantum computers don't have this problem, and they'll be able to produce a lot more computing at a lower energy cost. And that's important today because, for one thing, computing is becoming a major source of uh, global warming emissions. The hundreds of thousands of server farms around the world, even though cleverly sited in cold locations and some are being deployed on the ocean floor and so forth, already contribute as much greenhouse gas to the environment as does the aviation industry. Moreover, quantum computers scale up much, much more efficiently, exponentially more efficiently than conventional computers do. Quantum computers use qubits, which is a fancy term for, you could think of it as a quantum particle, um, the smallest quantum object that's capable of doing computing. If you have one of them, you have a one qubit machine. When you go, say, to a four qubit machine, you don't have four times the computing power of the one-bit machine, you have 16 times. If you can build a 300 qubit quantum computer, and that requires getting 300 so-called particles to work as a single quantum system, that 300-bit quantum computer, one tiny little chip, would outperform a conventional computer made of all the matter in the observable universe. So the potential for quantum computing certainly justifies a great deal of excitement. So first point, the hype appears to be justified. It's possible that quantum computing will run into some kind of roadblock and take longer to develop than people think, but uh, it's very unlikely that quantum computing won't sooner or later become the most uh, powerful form of computation available on Earth or perhaps anywhere else. So second, let me talk briefly about how a typical quantum computer works. And I'll talk about these kind of noisy systems that are currently very popular. What you do is you assemble a set of particles. These could be typically electrons set in little tiny race courses called Josephson junctions. That'd be one qubit, and then you assemble a chip with a number of them together side by side and you supercool the whole thing. If you look at photos of these kinds of quantum computers, you can see it looks like a big thermos bottle, and that's uh, most of that plumbing and equipment is there to chill the inside so that down around the bottom where the chip is, it's colder, in fact, than intergalactic space. And that allows the chip to operate in a relatively low noise environment. When allowed to settle down that way, the individual qubits meld, and you have a single quantum system that you interrogate, in this case by hitting it with pulses of electromagnetic energy. You hit it with a shaped pulse, you excite the system, and what the system does is to compute its new situation, to find the most time-efficient solution, and it drops back down into its lower energy original state and outputs a pulse which is its answer to the predicament that you put it in. Working quantum computers do this about 10,000 times a second. So although there's a lot of noise and error in the results, 
by repetitively asking questions, you can drive that noise level down. All of this may sound pretty exotic, and it is, but uh, there already are quantum computers online that programmers can log into and uh, use to solve problems. So they do work, although they're not yet at the state of efficiency and power that one expects to see on down the line. The immediate practical value of quantum computing is uh, pretty easy to determine. And one of the areas that a lot of people are concerned about, the reason why both governments and private industry are investing billions in quantum computing research, has to do with encryption. The secrets of governments and military operations uh, require encryption, but much more common is the encryption used uh, by millions of financial transactions every second going on around the world. And the most popular method for encrypting these uh, transactions is uh, what's called a public key. And in this case, the encrypted answer is a number, and the number is the product of multiplying two prime numbers together. For a conventional computer to figure out which two prime numbers generated this, this public number would take at least a billion years. A quantum computer can solve a question like that rather quickly. A fully accomplished quantum computer could probably do it in a fraction of a second. So you don't want to be the second place in the world to figure out how to use a quantum computer to do this because then the other folks are going to be reading all your encrypted material and putting it to advantage in terms of their national security or in terms of crime and so forth uh, before you are. Hence the race is on for effective quantum computing if only to lock up secrets in ways that can remain secret even in a world of quantum computing. And quantum computers should be useful for a lot of other things as well. But the great subject uh, for quantum computing, the reason that so many brilliant physicists and mathematicians are, are involved in quantum computing research, is simulation. Any quantum system can be used to simulate any other quantum system because the basic quantum rules are all the same. And that means that an effective quantum computer can be used to conduct experiments to test theories about nature and environments in which it is currently impossible to replicate in an experiment or to set up an observation. Environments like the edge of the event horizon of a black hole. You'll recall that Stephen Hawking discovered that black holes can't last forever because if they, unless they're fed more matter, they're just sitting alone in empty space, the quantum uncertainty around the event horizon means that some of the particles from inside will escape and the mass of the black hole will slowly decrease until it explodes, evaporates, returns its contents, including all the information that it has adduced back to the wider universe. No experimental apparatus that currently can be contemplated can replicate the curved space-time at the edge of a, a black hole. And it's not likely that we're going to be able to send a, a laboratory to a black hole to examine that environment directly. The nearest black hole to Earth is thousands of light years away. But a quantum computer can simulate that situation. So in that case, the pulses that you're sending to the chip are your theories, your hypotheses about how the system behaves. And the quantum system will tell you either, yes, that's how a quantum system would do it, or no, that somehow violates quantum rules. Ultimately, it may be possible to use quantum computers to conduct experiments that not only permit scientists to put together a proper quantum theory of gravity, which is to say of space-time, there are quantum field theories for all the other aspects of the known universe, but not the quantum fields that make up space-time, and perhaps even to go beyond that and determine what it is about nature that makes quantum fields and makes the laws of nature. Why does nature work the way it does? There's something very deep and interesting here it has to do with what Eugene Wigner used to call the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences. Why is nature so responsive to mathematical equations? You write the right equation, you can accurately predict the futures of uh, millions of different kinds of physical systems. Quantum simulations may not only explain the remainder of nature that's not currently covered by such theories, 
but could go down to the foundations, down to where the keys of reality lie, it is thought, to determine why quantum fields exist and why they behave the way they do. Hey, thanks for listening. See you next time. Thank you.